Hi, I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, a series of short personal stories where we explore the idea that truth can be stranger than fiction. This week's episode, entitled Love is a Bitch, has me stepping outside of my Manhattan art studio where I meet a beautiful new friend. Could this turn into something? Possibly, but nothing is more unpredictable than love. Love is a bitch. There is a lovely, very fashionably dressed woman standing next to the green subway pole at the corner of Bleecker and Lafayette, looking lost. She is statuesque, a couple of inches taller than me. She's also beautiful, I'm guessing in her early 30s, with a dazzling smile and great skin. As she stares at her cell and turns in a circle looking around, I can't help but offer my assistance. Hello, miss. Can I help you find something? Oh, thanks so much. I'm trying to find the Sephora store. Sure. Just just go this way to Broadway. Take a left. It's two blocks on your right. Thanks again. So are you a New Yorker? Yes, I am. I have a sculpture studio just down the block. Wow, so you're a professional artist? That I am. And how about you? I'm a model turned fashion designer, and I just finished with Fashion Week in Paris and now I'm passing through New York on the way home. Oh, really, where's home? She hesitates for a minute, as if wondering where she's from, before she says, Mississippi, and then continues, Well, thank you. Do you have a card or anything? I hand her my card, and she reads my name aloud, mispronouncing my French surname. I think that's odd for someone who spends time in Paris. Well, my name is Jesse, Jesse James. So nice to meet you. So who named you Jesse James? She responds, me. Then she heads off, most probably never to be seen again. A few days later, I receive a phone call from a woman whose voice I don't recognize until she reminds me of how we met on the street. Then Jesse continues, So Greg, I have a favor to ask. Since you're a New Yorker, would you mind showing me around town? Sure, I can do that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to an art opening this evening. Would you like to join me? Wow, that would be great. I've never been to an art opening. A fashion model and clothing designer who's never been to an art opening? I thought that was highly unlikely since the art world and fashion world are almost one and the same these days. A small red flag begins waving in my mind. What should I wear, she asks. Ah, wear whatever you'd like. At openings, you find people dressed in every possible fashion. When she shows up at the opening... She asked me to pay for her cab, which is waiting outside, which I do. Another red flag joins the first one in my mind, but she looks too fantastic in her tight red sheathed dress and very high heels, so I ignore it. She gets a lot of attention, but when I introduce her to various friends, she's ominously silent and seems to be incapable of small talk. Then she wants to leave to visit my studio for the first time, just as I'm starting to make my rounds. A third red flag is not waving in my mind, but I take her back anyway. For our next date, we're invited to join my close friend Peter and friends of his at a restaurant. I've told Peter about Jessie, and he wants to check her out. At the table, she is completely silent and can't pronounce the French name of her entree. The only one who tries to engage her is Peter, flirting outrageously. He doesn't mind the silence of a pretty girl. Then before dessert, she wants to go back to the studio. As we leave, Peter whispers in my ear, you lucky bastard, what a babe. Back at the studio, she asks if she can sleep over. I'm surprised, but completely up for it. When we get into bed, she kisses me on the forehead and rolls over to go to sleep. When I cuddle up to her and start to gently kiss her neck, she shares with me, So sorry, Greg, but a year ago I was raped, and I'm still healing. I hope you understand. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. I roll back over and try to fall asleep. In the morning, I'm awakened by the smell of breakfast. She's cooked a nice meal, over which she tells me she's a vegan. Then she goes on, If I'm going to be staying here, would you mind if I went food shopping and got some veggies and stuff? I think to myself, with all the red flags, 
No way you're going to be staying here, lady. But I do agree to her grocery trip. The next night, I have to leave her in the studio while I take a subway trip uptown for a meeting. I give her my spare set of keys, in case she has to go out, but remove one for the top lock, just in case. And I head out. Running late, I bound down the subway stairs, taking three at a time, to catch the number six train, which is in the station. My leather-soled dress shoes don't grip well, and as I cross the mid-stair landing, I trip, and before I can grab the railing, dive headlong down the stairs. My head hits the concrete before the rest of my body does. And then, it's lights out. When I come to, I'm disoriented and feel water running down my face. I must have been moved to a sitting position and leaned against the subway column. A very concerned man is squatting next to me. I try to get up, telling him, I have a train to catch. He physically restrains me, saying, You're not going anywhere. You're bleeding very badly. I called an ambulance, and my friend is upstairs on the street, waiting for it to arrive. At this point, I reach up and wipe the water off my face, then look down at my hand and find it's covered with blood. Then I pass out again. I awake to find myself in an emergency room bed. My head, wrist, and right knee are bandaged, and there's some paperwork on my chest, but no one is helping me. Every part of my body is in pain, and my wrist bandage is completely soaked through with blood. Oh my God, you really did do yourself in. It's Jessie's voice, and I'm so happy to hear her. No one is helping you? I'll see about that. She grabs two passing nurses and in no uncertain terms demands that they take care of me. I've never seen this side of her. Now she's anything but silent, taking control of the situation and forcefully getting me what I need. That's how she got into my heart. Red flags be damned. I was feeling so alone in the hospital, and she was so helpful. When we finally return to the studio, as she nurses me, I think to myself, maybe I need a woman like Jessie James in my life. As I start to recover, she has a bunch of requests. Can she have some cash to do a real grocery shop? Can she order a juicer and blender and some other kitchen items on Amazon? No problem, sweetie. I hand her one of my credit cards. She also asks for the address of my studio to order some makeup online. Sure. I'm so happy to have someone taking care of me that I pretty much give her whatever she wants. When she asks if she can move in with me, I agree without hesitation. Jessie's now been here for a week, and there are no red flags yet. She's asked me to cover her membership for Equinox, and I'm happy to do so, and she goes to the gym and works out every day. She's much more of a homebody than I expected, perfectly happy to spend all day in her bathrobe, on my couch, with her iPad and iPhone. Since I'm used to spending most of my time alone, her gym trips are a relief. The flip side is that I'm really getting into all of her tasty vegan dishes. That's something I never thought I would hear myself say. Today, she makes a very sweet suggestion. You know, you've been so nice about letting me live here and paying for everything. I'd like to reciprocate by working for you a couple hours every day. Maybe organizing or bookkeeping. You know, make your life a little easier. That sounds great, sweetie. I have some organizational stuff you could do. Also, can you paint, like paint walls? Sure, I'm a good house painter. So then she takes on a deep cleaning of my entire space and meticulously paints all my walls. Her next big ask comes two weeks after that when she suggests I fly her mother from Mississippi and put her up in a hotel. For the first time, I hesitate, saying, let me think about it. Time passes, and she keeps pressuring me, triggering another red flag to wave. Then she presents me with a handwritten timesheet of the hours she put in helping me out. When she asks me to sign it, I balk and respond, no, I don't want to do that. Now she's upset and gets nasty. So I cook for you, I clean for you, I work for you on painting your studio, and you won't help my mom to visit New York? That really sucks. In a huff, she moves out of the bedroom and permanently settles on the couch, after she turns it around to face the windows, 
and erects a couple of sheets of plywood that I have in my space, so now she's hidden away inside what looks like a child's play fort. Life goes on until I have an important studio visit. A columnist from the Wall Street Journal is going to interview me at week's end for a profile on my life as an artist. This is a big deal for me. The interview will last an hour. Given how annoyed Jessie is, I'm afraid she might sabotage the interview, so I ask her to go to the gym when the columnist visits. So you're ashamed of me and you want me to clear out? No, no, that's not it. I just want to keep my focus on the interview. You're such a prick, but I'll go to the gym. Maybe then you'll help my mom visit New York. The day of the interview arrives, but the writer shows up an hour early. On the intercom, I ask him to wait, then I race around tidying up and send Jesse to Equinox early. I clean off the big table where the interview will take place and throw the unwashed blender and juicer into a closet. I also decide to hide my old rusty trash can, so I put it in the same closet on top of the kitchen stuff. He arrives, and we have a good interview. Jesse returns shortly after he leaves. When she discovers that I put the grimy trash can on the new juicer and blender, she flips out. What the fuck is wrong with you? Are you just stupid? Who treats brand new expensive kitchen appliances like that? I respond angrily. I pay for them so I can treat them any way I want. Fuck you, she tells me, and goes and hides away in her little fort on the couch. That's when I decide I'm done with her. After her brutal reaction to the Wall Street Journal columnist's visit, and in spite of my trepidation, I suggest... Listen, Jesse, I think it's pretty obvious that neither of us is very happy in this situation, so I think you should move out. No fucking way, she laughs, and with her hands on her hips, angrily announces, I'm a tenant, and you can't throw me out. The legal definition of a tenant is someone who has keys, who's received mail at that address, and exchanges cash or something of value for rent. I'm such a fool. She has my keys. She's received mail here, the Sephora package, and she did volunteer to work for me. At least I had the good sense not to sign her timesheet. Her parting words are, Kick me out, dream on, Greg. And then she retreats to her little fort. Now things start to get very dark. Except to go to the gym, she hangs out in her bathrobe day and night, cursing me out in the foulest of language. Her robe hangs open, and she is often naked underneath, a little revenge exhibitionism. When I enter the studio, I immediately lock myself in my bedroom, which she doesn't have a key to. I'm a prisoner in my own art studio. A Google search brings me some more bad news. There's a site called I Hate Jesse James, with dozens of posts sharing terrible stories about her. A criminal background check reveals that she has outstanding warrants in four states. Unbelievable that I waited till now to Google her. After a week of solitary confinement, I decide to get some legal help. Before spending money on an expensive lawyer, I try an online service called Rocket Lawyer, which connects me with a lawyer who's an expert in landlord-tenant law. We have a dozen messages back and forth during which he crafts a strategy for my getting rid of my unwanted house guest. He has a plan which I carry out. Firstly, I'll need a couple hours to execute it while Jessie's not in the space, so her Equinox trips are perfect. I'll make an inventory and photograph all of her belongings. Next, I'll book her into a nearby hotel and place her bags in her room. I ask the night manager to inventory her things with me and sign an inventory sheet, which he's unwilling to do. It takes a $100 bill to get him to change his mind. The clock is ticking, so I hurry back to the studio. Then I put together an envelope containing a note which I make a copy of, with her hotel key card, a New York City metro card, and $500 in cash to get her back to Mississippi. After taping the envelope to the outside of my studio door and locking all three of my door locks, I sit and wait nervously. When she arrives back and can't get in, she starts pounding on the door relentlessly. I know you're in there, and you're going to be so fucked for doing this to me. I don't respond. The next morning, there are multiple texts and voice messages on my cell from four different friends, all basically saying, how could you put Jesse on the street in the middle of the night? What a mess. 
she's called all my friends. The only one I call back is Peter. I explain in detail what has transpired. I believe you, Greg, but she turns out to be a really nasty piece of work. In one of the four conversations that we had throughout last night, she told me she's been through all your files in the studio and she's going to report you to everyone she can think of, including the IRS. You don't need that, Greg. But I have a very honest accountant and he never takes chances with my returns. Greg, it doesn't matter. If she reports you, at the very least, you may end up being audited by the IRS for the rest of your life. He pauses, then continues, Look, she seems to trust me, so with your permission, I'll talk to her and see what we can work out. In his next call, he tells me that she will agree to terminate our relationship and never have any contact with me again if I pay her $10,000. I'm so pissed, I tell him, no way will I agree to that. After he talks back and forth between the two of us, I agree to pay her $4,000 and she signs the contract that Peter has been good enough to draft. The last time I saw her was at a bank as she got her cash and signed the contract. Getting back to the studio, I feel so relieved and happy. For six months now, I've tried to keep any thoughts of Jesse banished from my mind and am beginning to enjoy my life again. On Christmas Eve, I receive a thick FedEx envelope from the Anton Law Firm. Never a good sign. The 16-page document inside outlines how I have sexually abused my employee, Jesse James, and I'm being sued for $8.7 million. I gasp, thinking, there is no way I have anywhere near that kind of money. They claim that they have more than enough recordings, photographs, texts, and other documentary evidence to win their case. I actually sink to the floor as I read. God, I can't believe this nightmare still isn't over. After a couple days in a stupor, I decide to find a real lawyer. Rocket lawyer just won't cut it this time. The first two lawyers I interview specialize in sexual assault and harassment in the workplace. I'm embarrassed just to be talking to them. They both assure me that they can prevail in court. The third and most expensive lawyer, who gets $800 an hour, is semi-retired, schlumpy, and wearing a black sweater that has cat hair on it, but he also has 50 years of experience in the field. He carefully reads through my notes in summary, and when I mention going to trial, he says, Hell no! You don't need the incredible expense of a trial, and also in New York State, you must have three or more employees to be charged with sexual harassment or abuse in the workplace. He calls after his first round of negotiations with the Anton Law Firm. They're sharks! They came down from $8.7 million to 60000 in the first go-round. They know full well they have no standing because you're a one-man operation. After a few more interactions, they stop contacting my lawyer, hopefully forever. And that's it. Game over, problem solved. So what have I learned from this, the worst chapter of my life? Firstly, a pretty face can hide a black heart. Next, never date a woman who's named after a famous outlaw. And lastly, Google, Google, Google. The Compulsive Storyteller is written and narrated by me, Greg Lefebvre, and co-produced with Peter Kokoma, who also made our theme song. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love your help sharing the show. Please subscribe to The Compulsive Storyteller for free on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you listen, and it would be great if you could leave a review. Follow the show on Instagram, at The Compulsive Storyteller, and check out our website for more info at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. Thanks for listening, and if you didn't like this one, the next one will be another story. 